Hello and welcome to Talk Time. Now, this week we'll be taking a look at our history and we'll be taking, about, we'll be taking another look at the impact of history on our current development and perhaps look into other areas in Africa and share the experiences and thoughts of a very distinguished historian. Welcome to Talk Time. Life is really simple when you purchase from MalcolmOnline.com. Under my supervision, even my young boy can make orders from Malcolm Online. With Malcolm Online, you can order televisions, IT, mobiles, audio and musical equipment, power solutions, kitchenware, furniture, and many other items. Make secure payments with a credit card or debit card, any mobile money wallet, or simply pay cash on delivery. Choose the convenience of ordering anytime and anywhere with a valid ID for pickup from the nearest Malcolm branch or have orders delivered to any address within Accra. Thank goodness for maturity. Malcolm Online. Shop simple, shop secure. No fear, no email. Hello, welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated from the very beginning, we are taking a look at our history and its impact on us today. We'll be looking at other places in the world, if time permits. But most importantly, we are talking to a very distinguished historian. We are talking to Marika Shewu, who is originally from Hungary. Marika, you're welcome to the studio. Thank you very much, Gracie. It is a great honor to be here. Now, what brought you here this time? Well, I came to talk at the Kwame Nkrumah conference um, when I was talking about what I think was the beginning of the Cold War in Ghana, well, in the Gold Coast, in 1948, mm. when there wasn't supposed to be a Cold War in any part of Africa at all. And um, when I... When I stumbled across the information that made me begin to research this, I thought, well, we don't really understand what Nkrumah and the CPP and all of you fighting for independence, what you were facing. Because I think the idea then was that people in French colonies fought against the French, against the Belgians, and you were fighting against the British. But the British, in fact, on some issues were united with the other colonial masters and America was getting involved. And so it was much more complicated than just against the English. Um, now, do you want me to explain why I please, think the Cold do, War began? Do. All right. Well, um, after a lot of... Um, letter writing and campaigning in England, we got the government to release some of the withheld documentation from the colonies and on Kwame and Krumah. So the papers of MI5, that's military intelligence, that's the surveillance system on anybody who is doing things they shouldn't really be doing, um, have been released. I should point out here that even in the released papers, some material is withheld. So though I am looking at the papers on Kwame Nkrumah from 1947, the first ones released, mm -hmm. until mid-1948, some of that is withheld. So you think, well, what were the British doing that in 2016 I still can't see papers <laughs> for? You know, they want to keep things hidden. But what struck me on in these papers was that Nkrumah is always being released, referred to as a communist. Now, it is true that when he lived in America, worked for the African Students Association there, um, he was in touch with the Communist Party there, and I think they got some support from the party. But the Communist Party, especially in Harlem, was fighting on the streets against racial discrimination. So it was in the front line of the struggle against 
racial discrimination and, and for equality. Um, and by the way, the person that um, Anne Krumer, I think, was closest to was Claudia Jones, who was struggling for equality for women. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much she influenced Anne Krumer in his attitude towards the role of women in society. Um, anyway, when he, he goes to England, um, he gets in touch with the Communist Party there because of his experience in America. And he doesn't realize that the British Communist Party is somewhat different. It doesn't have black members and it doesn't recognize racial discrimination and it doesn't recognize colonial issues, mm -hmm. which is absolutely incredible. How you can be a communist and not recognize that is a bit difficult to comprehend. Now, why does Nkrumah get in touch with them? He arrives in England just before the 1945 Pan-African Conference. He works with George Padmore, McConnell, um, to help organize the conference. The people attending the conference are really the people who came back to Africa to struggle for independence. Mm -hmm. Um, so he meets everybody and everybody meets him, which I think is, is important. Um, but some of them have a problem with the conference. They say, well, yes, you, you talked about the need for us to be independent economically, not just politically. But there were no plans on how to achieve this. You know, what, what are we going to be doing? How, how are we going to get independence? So they decide to form... No, they decide to go to Paris because there was nobody from the Francophone activists living in Paris who had come to the conference. So they go to talk with them and decide to have a big conference in London to discuss ways forward. Mm -hmm. So there's a big conference in London in February 1946. It is organised by the association set up by Nkrumah, um, Akko Ajayi and other Ghanaians and Nigerians, now together with the Francophone Africans, which is called the West African National Secretariat. Mm -hmm. So that secretariat works with the West African Students' Union, which is also very politically active, to hold this conference. They say, well, how are we going to move ahead? A policy is lovely, but you have to do something. So they decide that um, you have to bring people together from West Africa. They're not talking about the whole of Africa, just West Africa, um, to discuss ways forward. How do we move? So they have more meetings to discuss this and decide that what they should do is have a conference in Lagos in October 1948, to which Everybody has to be invited. And by everybody, they mean the unemployed on the street up to the lawyer up there, the trade unionists, the women, the school children, the students. Everybody has to be invited because independence means we must all work together, which is wonderful, of course. Um, it's not done in Europe at all. <laughs> so there are plans on, on how to do this and what they do is um, they spread the message in France and in England and Krumer travels around England um, and I keep wondering what was it like for him to to learn to talk to Africans and West Indians living in Britain as well as the white workers because his experience is talking in America but he clearly does it very well. So Nkrumah must have had a great gift, not just of speaking, but of recognizing how to talk to different audiences, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty rare. Mm -hmm. It's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. um, so they spread the message and it goes out to the newspapers in, in all the West African colonies. If you look in the newspapers in Ghana for the time, there's, you know, all kinds of reports on the secretariat and so on. Um, so that's what they want to do. Of course, they can't hold the conference because of events here, the ex-servicemen's march and um, 
by the way, how many people were killed is still a question of debate. I mm. mean, as well as how many people were injured. Um, so there is a massive nationalist movement, right? And that it should be, for the whole of West Africa, is a great threat to all the colonial powers. So the question, I think, to them is, well, how are we going to deal with that? Because we can't attack them all as nationalists and people fighting for independence because World War II is just over and you can't now say, well, we're going to keep people repressed. It just wouldn't go down well mm -hmm. anywhere. And America, of course, has been saying independence for the colonies for quite some time. So that's the issue of America. And I think that is very problematic. America says, yes, end of independence. At the same time, when there is a campaign to have African representatives at the founding of the United Nations, Africa stops this. And I don't yet know why, but mm -hmm. it does, mm -hmm. which is a bit strange. Mm -hmm makes you question things. Mm -hmm. America stopped it. America stops it. There's yeah. a big campaign here and in the US mm. um, and America stops it. But on the surface America says independence for the colonies. Below the surface in the internal discussions it's about well we need access to the raw materials in all the colonies. Mm -hmm. At the moment we can only get them through the French companies and the Dutch companies and the English companies and they're making a profit. Mm -hmm. We want direct access. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to get that? Through independence, but then how? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of thinking and discussion they have to do, sort of in private, mm -hmm. without the colonial masters mm -hmm. knowing about their intentions. Um, At exactly the same time, there are two other issues. One is that um, Brit Britain and the European, the Western European countries, the Allies, will lend a lot of money by America, and America cuts this off the last day of World War II immediately. So all these colonial powers are in debt to the United States, and of course they've all been bombed and you know, all the men had been in the military and so there's that issue and what do you do with the men when they come home and, and all the factories mm -hmm. are just now producing guns and bombs and, we, you know, places being bombed. So America decides that it has to lend new money under different terms. So it lends Britain, and I'm sorry, I don't know how many billions, but it is many billions so many that there was a, a report in the British newspapers in 2006 that they had finished paying off that loan. <laughs> 2006. 2006. So Britain is hugely in debt. So is France and all the others, but we're talking of Britain. So there's that issue, because how is Britain ever going to repay when it's been bombed? The factories are manufacturing arms. And the only thing they have that's worth anything is the raw materials in, in the, the colonies. colonies. Yeah. So, but America wants direct access to them. And of course the Europeans want to keep it. So, you know, there, there, there's a few problems about, about that. Um, and the final problem is that um, though the USSR was part of the Allies in World War II, that split immediately after the war. Um, and of course the, the, poli the communist policy, communist philosophy is totally different from the Allies capitalist philosophy. So the capitalists are saying but the communists are going to move in and attempt to take over and impose their policies on our colonies. Mm -hmm. Well we've got to stop that. So, if we call Nkrumah 
a communist. We can work against him because everybody wants that. Nobody wants the USSR moving in. And we're not going to call him a nationalist or somebody fighting for independence. We're going to call him a communist. And it's the communists that really got the ex-servicemen to march. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is where the Cold War begins. Because, I mean, it, it looks to me as if Britain realizes that it can do this with the ex-servicemen's march to blame Nkrumah and to call him a communist. Well, and that, about the pretext for moving on Nkrumah. Yeah. So they spread this notion that Nkrumah is a communist and communism's coming in here, we've got to stop it. So Britain sets up, sends the head of MI5 out here to set up MI5 officers. Um, the CIA also moves in, but I don't yet know how many officers it was permitted to set up. Um, and all the powers begin to exchange the information gathered by MI5. Is there this. any evidence that before the Manchester conference, yes. the CIA and the MI5 were interested in criminals? Um, not as far as I know at the moment. The MI5 files begin in 1946 47. Um, which doesn't mean that there aren't earlier papers that haven't been released. Mm -hmm. um, the CIA had a file on him, but that was, it seems to me, a sort of regular file on, on incoming students from abroad. And I certainly have not been able to find anything else on him. Um, what about the FBI? Well, in, nothing in the released FBI papers. But we have to emphasize that, of course, much is withheld because they don't want us to know all that they were doing, all that they were doing. What they withheld is our history. Yes, it is very much your history. So is it right that countries like the UK, you know, and America, the United States of America, are withholding part of our history from us? No, it's not right at all. I think it's completely wrong. It's it's a, a new version of imperialism, if you like. Um, and I have had a number of discussions by email and some face-to-face -face with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London precisely about this and say all those documents should be returned to Kenya, to Ghana, to Nigeria and so on with all the papers there because they have now released... Um, some of the government papers as well. So I have been to the National Archives in London and asked to see some of these. So you are brought a file, governor's office, mm -hmm. governor's office from here. So it's the file taken from here. But you look at it and page one or two might be there and then the next page is blank. It is called deducted. A few pages on, half the page could be deducted. So you put in a freedom of information request, you write, and you get absolutely nowhere. You are told these are security issues. 70 years after the act. I'm looking at papers from <coughs> Ankrumah coming, Ankrumah in England, and until mid-1948. And I'm looking at these papers last year. So what was Britain doing at that time here that we still can't see the papers. Well, we was, we're talking to America Sherwood, who is a historian. She's more than a historian. She's an activist, uh, originally Hungarian, and she is researching on Nkrumah in the mid-1940s upwards. But we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, I'd like to find out from America what she's doing with the information that she's gathering. Short break. It's a beautiful day. I'm gonna make most of it. It's a beautiful day. A day to share with you. Your 
make my world go round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really got me saying, nice girl brings home happiness. Brings home happiness. Experience the wide range of t- quality and affordable electronics, phones, tablets, home and office appliances from NASCO. NASCO, bring home happiness. Hello, welcome back to Talk Time. We are talking to Marika Sherwood, who is a historian and activist. Now, Marika, what are you doing with all the information we are gathering? Well, I want very much to publish it as a small book here in Ghana at a price that everybody can buy. I don't want royalties. I just want people to be able to read this history because I think we have to do an enormous amount of research because the Cold War is about manipulation. And let me, can I give a couple of examples of manipulation? Um, One is that, that, and Krumah sets up a newspaper, right, which is really beyond the stretch of this book, but I, I'm going to outline it a little. So somebody says, well, um, we ha- you can sue them for libel, and somebody else replies, well, we're already doing that. <laughs> and of course, then Krumah and the papers were sued for libel again and again. And then I come across a, an article by George Padmore in one of the papers here, saying, it's a very strange um, rumour going round that one of the British newspaper companies is going to set up a newspaper in Nigeria and Ghana. So I read this and I think, well, I can see why you're a bit bewildered, Padmore, because they're not going to make any money. Mm -hmm. So why on earth would they come to set up here? So I do some research on this. The paper is the Daily Mirror in London, owned by that and many other papers, owned by one family. So this is a man called Cecil King who is in charge of the Mirror. So I tried to do a bit of research on Cecil King. And in some memoirs of some MI5 officers, they say, two in two two books, that, well, we were quite close to Cecil King. So I think, well, that's interesting. So I think, no, why would that be? So I read Cecil King's memoirs. I read everything I can find. There's nothing in the National Archives, by the way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. Nothing in his memoirs either, except that he sets up the papers and he sends out the latest printing presses. Mm -hmm. So it must have cost an absolute fortune, never mind to manufacture the presses, but to send them out and to send people out to train them on how to maintain the presses and so on. And that family has um, tree plantations in Canada, so there's no shortage of newspaper supply, which is another post-war issue. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. there's everything. So I begin to read books on the press, and what I find... Um, in books on the newspapers and on the secret agencies, MI5, that MI5 um, in the colonies has to be situated within the embassy and and the major district offices. You can't set up a special MI5 Mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. So they're in the embassy. But how do you go and collect information and spread information when somebody asks you, how do I get in touch with you? And you have to say, well, in the embassy. Mm -hmm. But if you work for a newspaper, it's different. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me pretty clear that the government did a deal with Cecil King to set up a newspaper here, partly so it can propagandize about the glories of Britain with the latest printing presses and the best newspapers, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also as a home for MI5 officers to pretend they are journalists so they can go everywhere, talk to everybody, collect information and spread information. We are talking about the origins of the state-owned daily graphic. Yes. 
That's what we're talking about. Yes, yes, I am indeed. I am indeed. I mm. am indeed. Mm. So this is the kind of manipulation going on. Um, something else that I think is crucial for us to do much more work on, and again, this is beyond this book. It'll be in, in the next book. Um, but it's so important that somebody very close to Nkrumah and I won't give you his name now until I am 100% positive because it just wouldn't be right. But somebody very close to Nkrumah goes to the American consul and says, I can give you the names that Kwame Nkrumah and George Padmore are using to correspond with each other. The nicknames. The, the well, no. Names. Padmore would have known that any letter he gets is opened up by MI5 and he would have known that his telephone is monitored. Mm -hmm. By the way, the government has released not one file on George Padmore. Not one. Not one. And he was the great activist in Britain from 1933 onwards. Nothing. Anyway, he and Nkrumah were very close. And Padmore has a long history, but he knew all the black political activists from one end of the world to the other and was a great thinker and writer and political philosopher. And then Krumer says that he spent half his life sitting in Padmore's kitchen discussing things with everybody else who was also sitting there. Um, so for those names to be revealed so that the government can look at Nkrumah saying to Padmore, well, I think we, I ought to be or we ought to be doing, uh, uh, and Padmore saying, well, yes, all right, but how about this? and so on. You can see what that means. The government can make sure that whatever they decide is not going to work. So, And that to me is crucial and we somehow have to find as much of that correspondence as we can so we can try to follow up because we just don't know what was going on. In your view, to what extent did Padmore and people like Macron influence Nkrumah. I think Padmore probably influenced him a lot. If he hadn't, or and if Nkrumah had didn't have respect for him and his knowledge and every everybody that he knew, he would not have brought him over here and appointed him head of the Bureau of African Affairs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I haven't really researched Ghanaian history, but I do know that there was some opposition to, to Padmore, um, with people saying, well, he's a West Indian, he's not an African. So I don't know whether there was opposition even when Nkrumah was appointing him, never mind when he arrived. But I imagine he would have. And if you read Padmore's books, I think they are very important. Um, you know, and he came from a, um, what you would call a very ordinary family in Trinidad and, mm -hmm. and managed to get some education. Schooling there was not much more available than here. Um, and had to go to America to get higher education and there joined the Communist Party because there it was active. Um, went to Moscow and Moscow respected him so much they had him teach at a university though he had no degrees, Padmore has no official qualifications. Then they made him editor of the Negro Worker, which I think was, or to me the importance of the Negro Worker is that he did his best to, to spread that journal out everywhere by moving the office to Hamburg so that he can give the papers to the seamen because he knew that the governments would stop them going out mm -hmm. by post. But if he gave them to the seamen and said, you know, these are the ones to mail when you stop in Freetown and so on, they were delivered. And that was giving information to people about the struggles in all of the colonial countries. So I think that gave people a lot of strength and, and ideas. Well, if they did that, maybe we can try it here as well. So I think that also was important and that might well be one of the reasons why the West African National Secretariat also produced a journal mm. called The New African. Mm. And 
I think maybe they got some funding for that from the British CP. Maybe. The There's Communist nothing. Party in Britain. Yes. Yeah. Mm. But there is nothing in their archives. Mm. I have been through their archives twice and there's nothing. So I don't know. It's possible that they didn't. Mm. They did get money from here and the paper was sent out here and it is reported in the local papers here. Mm. But unfortunately there were only six issues and then the money must have dried up. Well, viewers, we are talking to America Shewu, a historian and an activist. And we're going to take another very short break. And uh, when we come back, I'd like to find out from America whether she's looked at the Soviet end of the story, whether she's had the opportunity uh, to look at what is available in the, in the former Soviet Union about the Cold War in 1948. Short break. How much is this? 600. Wonderful. I think I'll take this one. But um, what's your size? Uh, 44. This is 43. I can tell you 44. This is the man. Your home of quality shoes from the UK. We have various shoes for the office, for your formal and casual occasions. Visit the man in Abilengpe. Our office is located just behind Aquatech. Our telephone numbers are 020-873-7166. You can also reach us on our landline 0302-730-760. We'll be expecting you. Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time, where we are talking to Marika Sherwood, a historian originally from Hungary, now living in the United Kingdom and an activist. Have you had the opportunity to look at the Soviet end of things? Well, I have only been to the Moscow archive once, and I was looking mainly for information on Padmore. Um, so I wasn't looking for the Cold War, unfortunately, and I haven't got money to go back. And I am told that they too are now withholding some funds. <laughs> I don't read Russian, so I could only read the um, material in English. Um, so there was stuff on Padmore, of course. But I have looked at, I think, every book there is on Russia and Africa. And they all say that Russia, the USSR, had no plans for coming to Africa until well into the 1950s, which doesn't mean that it wasn't interested in trying to spread communism. But it did it in some ways that the Americans and the British were spreading capitalism by offering studentships at the universities. Mm -hmm. um, and that went on for some time because I remember somehow or other some Ghanaians in Budapest in my hometown um, discovered me and got in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what they did. They, they offered scholarships. Um, they held international conferences and you were usually given the flight and, and the hotel because they knew you didn't have anything. Um, and they did try very hard to influence the World Federation of Trade Unions, which of course led to America breaking it up, which to me was an absolute tragedy because the, the struggles of trade unions against capitalism is, is terrible and they tried to stop it. And, you know. So to me, the WFTU was very important um, and they stopped it. Um, but nobody could find any evidence whatsoever of the USSR having any interest about coming here. Or meddling in the colonies. Yes. Yeah. Not until much, much, much later. Mm. You know. And in some ways, of course, it, it makes sense because they had just conquered Eastern Europe and they had their own problems to deal with until all of that was settled down a bit. And, of course, they didn't have a need for raw materials from here either, I think, because there's quite enough in the other countries that were now there, so... 
In America, you have become such a respected historian. What is it that made you interested in history, and particularly the history of decolonization? What is it that made you so interested? Well, my interest didn't start in decolonization. Um, I was teach. I after I come from a Jewish family, and what was left of us emigrated to Australia, and I went to England in 1965, and I was teaching in a high school there. Well, first I taught in an infant school, and then a primary school, and that was my introduction to racism. I knew about what had been done to the Aborigines in Australia and I was involved in the struggle about trying to get them some rights but I mean it was truly hopeless and of course most of them had died because their wells were poisoned by the British I mean mm. The, mm. yeah so I came with um, w with no other notion about Britain except what you are taught in Australian schools which is about the glories of Great Britain. Great Britain's absolutely wonderful place. And then you arrive there and you begin to see that, well, it's not. And you see the social class differences are even greater than in Australia. And because I'm teaching in school, instead of struggling for Aborigines, you know, 300 miles up there, I'm facing the ignorance, the prejudices of my fellow teachers. And that's not what I expected out of the mother country. So I have an awful lot to learn. And I get, I knew nothing about the West Indies, for example. And most of the children in the 1960s, or a majority were from the West Indies and not directly from Africa. So the only way I could learn about the West Indies was to talk to the parents, because there were no books, there was nothing. And what really sparked me off and I will never forget we had been teaching World War Two, which was focusing on VE Day, victory in Europe and I was on playground duty which means you have to keep the peace right and some name calling begins between the white kids saying to the black kids well your uh, parents it's sweet uh, we won the war no. And the black kids don't answer back with any knowledge. Now, I had learned from the parents about the involvement of the West Indies in World War II, not only in the military and the Air Force, but Britain would have starved if it hadn't been from the food from the colonies. You know? mm. And a fight begins, so I have to separate the fight. And what is what I'm then saying to myself, I have to find a way of putting knowledge into the hands of the kids so they fight with knowledge, not with fists. Mm -hmm. You get nowhere fighting with your fists. But you know, I'm not a trained historian, I'm a full-time teacher. I talk to people to say, you know, we need all this and everybody says, mm, what rubbish are you talking about? You know. So it wasn't until about four or five years after this that I'm now I trained as a psychotherapist because I wanted to begin to understand the level of damage that was being done to the children in the schools. And I'm now working in a polytechnic and I have immense problems with, with the curriculum there and, and with how the black students are treated. And there is one black lecturer, Colin Prescott, who is from Trinidad. So I go, he's, he's uh, running courses on underdevelopment, which was new to me, so I ask if I can attend his course, and he says, of course, so I have a whole new door open to me. And I talk with Colin about the need for all this research, and he says, well, Mariko, you know it's important, do it. And I said, I'm not a historian, I have no idea how to do research. And he and I were joking about this the other day, how we will never forget how he looks at me and says, if it's important, you will do it. <laughs> and he just sits and looks at me. And I thought, you so-and-so, all right, I'll do it. So that's how I became interested in West Indian history, in the appalling racial discrimination going on in England, um, and then in black political activists in England. 
you know, what were they doing about what was being done to them? Um, and then I came here because I was researching Padmo, a great political activist, right? And I was staying at Legon at the university, this is 1988, and somebody goes to introduce me to Professor Adu Bahin, who says, um, you are going to do some work on Nkrumah. And I said, well, you know, I mean, he's, he's a Ghanaian. I mean, I, I, how can I research a Ghanaian? It's difficult enough to research a West Indian, you know. And he says, well, we don't have money to go to America and Britain, and we need to know what he was doing there. But I don't do anything, because I know next to nothing about Ghana, and I have enough to do. But then I'm back here a couple of years later, and Professor Bahin says, um, Marika, how is your research on Nkrumah going on? <laughs> so I thought, well, if I want to come back here, I'd better get on. So that is what introduced me to, well, I learned about decolonization, you know, in the classes, but this is what introduces me to Nkrumah and, and to the struggle here. Um, and. I, I haven't focused on it at all, you see, because, I mean, there's just so much research to be done. And believe it or not, it is only in this coming academic year that our first black studies department is being opened. Mm. Mm. Our first black studies department. So, so imagine how much research needs to be done. Africans have lived in Britain for a mere 2,000 years. So there's just a bit of research to be done, never mind all the colonies. Well, viewers, we have been in a conversation with Marika Sherwood, a historian and activist, and hope that all of us have learned a thing or two. I mean, she has so much to say that we can't say in 45 minutes. And I do hope that next time when she passes by, uh, we'll be able to continue this very interesting conversation. Marika, thank you very much for coming to thank the Thank you. Studio. I hope people listened, and I do hope if we get my book published, then maybe I can come back and... And then we can discuss the book and all. Well, but this is Pan-African Television, as you do know, and we will bring you the best on our history, and our current situation, and our future. Please keep watching Pan-African Television. Until we meet again. It's goodbye from all of us at Pan African Television, the production team, everybody, makeup artists, cameramen, all of us. Goodbye until we meet again next week. Bye bye.